What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another video here with the lawyer you know. My name is Peter Tragos, and I should be in trial right now, but I'm not. We will talk about why at the end of the video for anybody that cares, what happened in trial, why I'm here doing a live, doing a video, working today, instead of in the courtroom, trying the case that I was preparing for so long to try. Um, it's the reason we haven't had a lot of videos over the last few days, a couple recorded ones. We're going to play another redirect after this video today um, that was recorded before. But we are here hanging out. I'm never going to complain about hanging out with you guys, but it is frustrating to be here and not trying the case. So um, we're going to talk about Sarah Boone. We're going to start with Sarah Boone, discuss how she has a new lawyer. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the new judge. He's not brand new like the lawyer was brand new last week, but I want to dig in a little bit more into this judge and to this lawyer to give us an idea about who they are, what we can expect. Um, I, I still haven't found the full hearing of uh, Sarah Boone getting this new lawyer. Um, I was a little surprised that I didn't hear a lot about the back and forth between um, the judge and Sarah Boone about maybe he wasn't going to let her go, or maybe this is the last one or anything like that. So we'll see if that uh, happens. We'll see if, you know, that comes up. If anybody has the full clip of the hearing, feel free to send it to me. Um, we're going to watch about two minutes of it and break down some of the quotes and what was said um, before we get into who the judge is and who the lawyer is. Um, so stick around for all of that. Make sure you hit the like button if you guys haven't already and make sure you subscribe to the channel as we continue to break down these cases. Um, and eventually this will go to trial and I'm going to pop over to Orlando to see some of it, to give you what's going on in the courtroom. Um, but let's first get to this article here. Whoops. Let's get to this article. We're going to watch the clip. And then we will read part of the article together as well. All right, here we go. And you see here, Sarah Boone faces charges after investigators say she murdered her boyfriend by leaving him zipped up in a suitcase. Police arrested her four years ago, and she was in court this morning to ask that her case quickly move forward. West News' Bob Hazen was in the courtroom where the judge gave Boone another lawyer. Sarah Boone's been through a lot of lawyers. In fact, this is now her seventh attorney, her last one saying that she wanted him to do things that he wouldn't do. I've been here for four years and I'm tired of being here and I'm tired of going through all of these attorneys, which are not my fault. Sarah Boone is getting another chance to find the right lawyer to defend her in this bizarre case. In 2020, investigators say she let her. Let's watch the quote again. And somebody said I'm freezing, so I'm trying to figure out why. I have no idea why I'm hardwired in to a separate line. Um, uh, so a bunch of people are saying freezing. That's annoying. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I've asked John a thousand times about this and he said he didn't want me to freak out. So he didn't tell me he's freezing. So I apologize if it's freezing. I don't know why, because I only have this on this internet, but um, here's the point. Okay. So Sarah Boone is um, in court complaining that it's not her fault that she's going through all these lawyers. Um, so we're going to watch it together, hear what she has to say, hear what the lawyer has to say, and we'll, we'll break down what we think is going on. Sarah Boone's been through a lot of lawyers. In fact, this is now her seventh attorney, her last one saying that she wanted him to do things that he wouldn't do. I've been here for four years and I'm tired of being here. I'm tired of going through all of these attorneys, which are not my fault. Sarah so she's tired of it and it's not her fault. We at least, at least partially it's her fault. Come on. We got to take some responsibility for our actions and what we do, especially if the same result keeps happening, it's probably at least partially our fault, right? She takes no responsibility. She says she's sick of it. She says she's been here for four years and she wants to get this over with. Well, this attorney is going to come and defend himself. And we're going to hear at least a little snippet of what he has to say to defend himself. And that this is Sarah Boone's fault. 
Sarah Boone is getting another chance to find the right lawyer to defend her in this bizarre case. In 2020, investigators say she left her boyfriend, George Torres Jr., zipped up in a suitcase after a game of hide and seek and recorded him begging for help. Oh, uh, uh, I can't breathe, Seriously. Yeah, that's when you do when you choke me. Boone allegedly went to bed and then found him dead in the suitcase the next day. Since then, Boone's trial has been delayed repeatedly as she gets into conflicts with her lawyers, something the judge in her case noted. Seemingly all of your relationships with counsel have deteriorated. Boone often writes, Again, all of your relationships with counsel have deteriorated, yet these lawyers can represent other people and somehow get the job done with other people, but not for you. And that's the point. These aren't lawyers that don't have any other cases, don't have any other clients, have never seen or heard or dealt with the criminal justice system before. They have, and they will continue to. So Sarah Boone better make it work because eventually the lawyer is going to say enough is enough, or the judge is going to say enough is enough. Writes letters to the judges complaining about her lawyers. Attorney Winston Hobson was appointed back in September, but asked the judge to let him withdraw, saying they're at All right, so here, this is the important part. This is Winston Hobson, her seventh lawyer that asked to be taken off the case. She seems to be okay with it. And he's going to tell us at least one of the reasons why right here. And this is the important quote here for this video. At loggerheads, and she makes difficult demands. I would say Ms. Boone has some ideas about what should be done, should not be done. I don't agree with those. Some things she wants done, they won't do. Ms. Boone has some ideas of what she wants done, what she doesn't want done, and some of the things she wants done, I won't do. And so I'll tell you, that is code for basically my client is asking me to do something illegal or unethical. That's what that's code for. It's not like she wants me to call this friend and I want to call that friend. It's not like um, she wants me to ask for this much money for an expert and I'm asking for that much money. This usually comes down to she's asking me to do something illegal. She's telling me she wasn't drinking, but now she says, oh, I want to say I was drunk if that's my best defense. I've had clients try to do stuff like that before where they've already said, no, 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 I didn't do this. Oh, well, if it's better for my case, let's just say I did that. And it's like, no, we can't do that. Can't do that. Sometimes they're adamant and the rubber meets the road eventually. And that's definitely what it sounds like is happening here. There hasn't been enough time for there to be all these delays. Now she says his phone is broken. I don't hear again because we don't hear the entire hearing. But to me, she tries to say, oh, I have these 100-day delays, no cell phones working, things like that. But in reality, it seems like it comes down to she's asking him to do things that are unethical or wrong or that he won't do. And now we'll see if the next lawyer does. But when 100 days have passed and I haven't heard or said or done anything other than try to figure out where you are because your phone doesn't work, I'm not a bad person because of that. The judge. So nobody says she's a bad person because of that, right? But it is interesting that she says that in open court, which is also why I would have liked to hear the back and forth or if the lawyer defended himself or what he said, because she clearly stated, I try to talk to you, I call you over and over again for 100 days and you don't pick up because your phone doesn't work. Here is her new lawyer. Judge gave Boone a new lawyer, but did not push back the trial, which is currently set to start in May at the Orange County Courthouse. So that's also wild that this trial is still on for May. Still on for May. Brand new lawyer jumping in, and here we go. Right? I mean... It's, it's pretty wild to think that this lawyer is going to be ready in just a couple months and all these other lawyers couldn't get anything done in that amount of time. Um, I wanted to read the quote just to make sure we were saying it right. Whoa, whoa. Ms. Boone has some ideas about what should be done, should not be done. I don't agree with those. Some things she wants done, I won't do. The quote from Mr. Hobson. Very interesting to me. Okay. So first let's take a look at her judge and let me give you some insights on her current judge. I did not know the last judge. I had never met him, Mr. Wooten, judge Wooten. Um, but this judge is Michael Kranick. 
And I could be saying his last name wrong, okay? Because while I know Michael Kranick, I did not know his name for most of the time I was hanging out with him and talking to him. And the reason for that is, and I didn't even know this was him, if I'm being honest, until I saw his picture and I saw him on the video. And I was like, gosh, that guy looks so familiar. And I pulled up his, his uh, website here, him on the website. And I was like, oh, that's where I know this guy. So if you remember back, if you're an OG lawyer, you know, follower, when I was the uh, section chair, the president of the Young Lawyers Division for the Florida Justice Association, we put on the FJA mock trial competition um, every year. And every year, schools from across, across Florida would um, come and compete in that mock trial competition. Now, they all have coaches. And we can't know the coaches. We don't know which coaches coach which teams, um, except obviously sometimes Florida State, because there will be a buddy or somebody I know or a professor of mine or somebody that coached when I was on the team. Um, so we'll know that, and we don't judge those rooms or things like that. But Michael Kranick was one of the coaches for one of the teams that we met, talked with, hung out with over multiple weekends over the years that we were doing this. He is incredibly nice. and. I loved his energy because you think judges or lawyers, um, like they come and they coach this stuff. Maybe they don't really care. This dude cared about mock trial. He cared about his team. He cared about his students. He prepped them hard. They did a great job. And I believe, I'm pretty sure one of his teams won one of the years that I was either the chair of the mock trial committee or the section chair. And you can see he went to Florida State. A plus education for undergrad. And he went to Barry for law school. And that is, I believe the team that he coached was Barry, um, that one. So that was cool. Uh, and you can also see he has been a judge in the domestic violence, um, family court, domestic relations. And now how is he the new judge for Sarah Boone? Well, in 2024, he rotated on to Orange County Criminal Division as a circuit court judge dealing with felonies, which is what Sarah Boone's accused of. Okay? So this is her new judge, really good dude. He's going to be really fair. He's going to take it very seriously. He's going to be calm. He's going to be cool. He's going to be collected, but he's not going to be afraid to make decisions, which are the kinds of judges we like. I've never seen him in action in the courtroom before, so that'll be interesting to see um, and cool to see as well. Next. Well, before we get to her lawyer, let me see if there are any questions here. Valerie said, loving the new setup so far. Yeah, I'm going to be really ticked if Wi-Fi um, doesn't work here, though, and we got to figure that out. Peter, how many clients have you had to fire? We probably fire two or three a year. Not a ton. Two or three a year, max. Like 1%, I'd say less than 1%. Erica, respectfully, when is enough enough? How common is this? Is there a Guinness record for, or she's attempting to break? I don't know what the record for most lawyers is. Um, yes, there is a moment when enough is enough to me. There is. Um, at some point, we've got to call it. We can't just let her keep going through lawyers and wasting tax dollars, having new lawyers get up to speed on the case. So that is really frustrating. But we're not there yet, according to the judge at least. Welcome, Francine, to the membership crew. Uh, Gaia, how does the court deal with defendants who have personality disorders? So if they're not found to be incompetent, the court will work with them, will talk to the attorneys, will trust the attorneys, and, and try to create a good working relationship as best as they can, but eventually they do have to draw the line. Elise. Is that view about not lying for your clients mainly about morals because there are defense attorneys that I feel are lying for their clients? Every person makes their own decisions in life and as an attorney, okay? Um, I learned from my dad and was always the way I was going to do it that my morals and values were going to shine through to help my client not hurt them, um, but also not to do what I knew was wrong regardless of money, success, fame, um, winning a case. It was never going to come down to that for me. Um, when you make the decision to stay as far away from the line as possible, you don't have to really swim in a lot of gray areas. Erica J, thanks for gifting five memberships. 
This is lawyer number eight that we are about to take a look at here, and it's Patricia Cashman. And I've got some sources in Orlando that tells me that tell me she is very, very tough, no nonsense. Um, she is uh, an adjunct professor. Let's take a look here at her resume. So it says UCF adjunct professor. So she does some teaching. Um, she went to University of Florida, wah, wah, wah. Um, law school, N nothing wrong with that law school, just not the Harvard of the South, like Florida State. Um, Northern Illinois, undergrad. She's currently in private practice. She has her own law firm, but she was an assistant, assistant public defender for what is this, 16 years, it looks like. Yeah, 16 years, she was a, an assistant PD. So she takes court-appointed cases now in private practice. That's not unusual. Not unusual for private lawyers, especially not unusual for, um, uh, for people that used to be public defenders and then went out on their own. Um, yes, her first female attorney, I believe. I believe this is going to be her first female attorney. Maybe this will be the right fit for her. Maybe this is the right type of personality. Maybe it's the right type of attorney um, that she needs. So to me, I think we will see if that works. Yes, she was appointed by the judge, for those of you asking. All right. Why do you have to fire your client, Peter, if you don't mind me asking? No, I don't mind you asking. Something similar to this, where they either ask us to do something unethical or illegal, they've already told us what happened, and then they tell us they want us to lie or put up a witness that'll lie. Um, I've had clients who tell me they're faking their injury halfway through and how they were never injured, and you know they don't want to pay these medical bills. And I'm like, well, if you're lying to me and committing a fraud, I'm not continuing this fraud. Um, and or clients, you know, that I don't take a lot of times for cases if you know, they're like, Hey, I got in a car accident. I'm not hurt, but I heard you can get me money. We're not taking cases like that. Uh, Brandy, I think this is her first female attorney. I'm not positive, but I think it is. Uh, Leo, do private lawyers then get paid by the state to be a defendant defense lawyer for Sarah Boone? Yes. If you're on the court appointed list, you have to take certain classes and uh, make sure you have certain certifications and things, um, and things to get on the list. And then once you're on the list, there's kind of a rotation. And once you're on the rotation, the court's like, you're going to take this case. It's different than being a private attorney because you can kind of be forced to take a client you might not want. And you can charge maybe $600 an hour as a private lawyer. But if the court appointed list takes $75 an hour, then that's what you get paid um, for those cases. All right. Another thing that I thought was interesting to help us get to know Patricia Cashman is she put an interview on here, interview with Young Lawyers Division, Women in the Profession Committee of the American Bar Association. Kind of cool. Will help us get to know her a little bit. This says 213.24. So I don't know if this like was just posted today, if that's possible. That'd be kind of cool. All right. How did you get where you are? Hard work and tenacity, or as some would say, my sheer stubbornness. I have been in private practice for 17 years. I was able to purchase an office building in 2006 and I added the title landlord to my resume, a goal many women don't achieve. I started law school in 1981. My class was 70% male. It never crossed my mind when I applied to the University of Florida that I was entering a male dominated profession. My parents believe women should be provided the same opportunities as men. I was lucky to work for a boss at my first job who also believed that. I stayed at that job and grew and learned for 17 years. I also think it's kind of cool how her, her website is pink so she embraces it. Um, being a female lawyer, and I'll tell you, um, it may still be hard today, still a, a male dominated profession, I think, but in 1981, it was a lot more male dominated, even more difficult way back then than it is now. So respect. Did you plan to get where you are? If not, what was your plan and why, how did it change? Of course not Do any of us, but I'm exactly where I should be in my career. I started as an assistant public defender, like many new lawyers. The plan was to get two years of litigation experience, get a job with a big firm, and someday be a partner with a corner office. So I will tell you, some of you may not know, a lot of people go into the public defender's office or the state attorney's office to get trial experience. Because as you're about to find out, if you stick around to find out what happened with my trial, 
it's very difficult to get cases to actually go to trial, especially in private practice. They settle or resolve or plead for so many different reasons. And we've talked about that before, how like one to 5% of cases actually get to trial. But if you're at the public defender's office or state attorney's office, when I was at the state attorney's office, um, in just a few months, I tried like nine cases in six weeks or something like that. So you can get a lot more trial experience at the state attorney's office or the um, public defender's office. And that's why a lot of people start there. So that makes sense that that's why she started. And a lot of times they leave after two or three years. Usually they want a commitment of two or three years. Then you go out and somebody hires you because they didn't have to teach you to try cases. They can hire you after you've gotten all that trial experience over the last two or three years. Um, instead, I love being a criminal defense attorney and I love the courtroom. I love the challenge. And then I second chaired my first death penalty case and I was hooked. Constitutional issues, forensics, mental health issues, fighting the good fight to save clients' lives. Well, she's in for a good fight here, right? I was competing against male lawyers with more trial experience. It is fun going David and Goliath. One of the supervisors in the office said a woman would be too emotional to handle the position. I am proud to say I proved him wrong. My boss gave me the pos pos position and I eventually became head of the division. I plan on staying there until I retired. Then my boss retired and there was an election. My candidate lost. There would not be a place for me with the new administration. I had other job offers, but decided it was time to start my own firm. I, I had also become an adjunct professor and published a book, Accomplishments I Had Not Planned On. So we talked about Ufferman, how he published a book. Very cool. She publishes a book. Also, just some more for you guys to learn, right? And for us to go through together. I would have never thought to bring this up. And it's cool that these cases bring up different topics for us to discuss. So when you're working for the public defender or you're working for the state attorney or the attorney general, they are elected positions for the most part. And when a new election happens or somebody retires, if your guy or your gal or the candidate you are supporting loses, sometimes you lose your job. Assistant state attorneys, assistant public defenders, assistant U.S. attorneys, assistant attorney generals, they lose their job many times when their boss either retires or loses an election. And that's what happened here to Patricia. And that's why she eventually started her own firm. Very cool. What pitfalls have you faced as a female attorney? I became a member of the death penalty steering committee. One lawyer represents each of the 20 judicial circuits in Florida. I arrive at my first meeting, 19 men and me. Not all of them were receptive to having a female on the committee. I served on the committee for over 10 years. Several of those lawyers are friends of mine to this day. Some clients did not want to be represented by a skirt lawyer. I learned it was important to discuss those issues when they arose. Opinions won't change without dialogue. And I think it's cool. Obviously, I'm not a minority. I'm not a female. But one of the things I have had to discuss with clients in the past, especially when I first started, was dealing with a young lawyer or a lawyer who looks young. Um, or, you know, they can't believe if you have 10 years of experience or something, 10 years of experience is nothing. So it is very important to have those conversations up front. I really respect. I'm glad I'm reading this. This is a really cool interview. Um, I used to show up for depositions and get asked if I was the court reporter. This happens less often now. The fact is no longer assume that the female is the court reporter is a positive change. When those types of incidents occur, it's important to handle those situations with grace. Ask the person why the assumptions made. Realize you have a teaching moment. Use it. You know I love that. You know I love when grace is given because I need a lot of grace. A lot of people need a lot of grace. And, um, and the more grace we can give, the better we are. Um, what advice would you give young women attorneys? Find some good mentors. They can be male or female. Ask questions about practicing law and about life. If you're unhappy in your career, feeling unfulfilled, don't be afraid to change jobs. There are so many opportunities for those with a law degree. Be brave enough to make a change. Find a work-life balance that works for you. Get involved in volunteer work. I serve on the advisory board of legal studies department of the University of Central Florida, where I am an adjunct. I coach a college trial team uh, that competes in tournaments all over the United States. I learn from them and they learn from me. I teach trial seminars from attorneys. Never stop learning. And evolving. So that's what I was talking about with you guys. It's like she's teaching a mock trial group and she's learning from them. That's what happens. Uh, how has the legal profession changed since you started your career? In a word, technology. There was no internet when I entered practice. I learned, researched in a library. Uh, you spoke with opposing counsel on the phone or met in person. Most communication is done by emails. There are more lawyers and more female lawyers. We are more accessible, but it is more difficult to unplug and take a break from work. I agree with that. And I think my dad would echo that. What do you believe to be the current perception of women attorneys? 
I think we are more respected and accepted than when I began practice. It is encouraging to see first for our women, but it is also a reminder that there's still progress to be made. We are now allowed to wear pants to court, but we can't wear open-toed shoes to the jail. I worked in an office that was one of the first to allow job sharing for women. It began when two women returned from maternity leave and wanted to continue with their careers, but have quality time with their children. Very cool. When one of them transitioned back to full-time, a male attorney took advantage of the opportunity to job share. What a great example of thinking outside the box, regardless of gender. I initially offered virtual space to women lawyers with children who wanted to participate part-time. Today, I also have a male virtual tenant. Any tips for female attorneys when asking for a raise? My advice is the same regardless of gender. Never ask for a raise because you need one. Ask for a raise because you've earned one. I agree. Prepare bullet point bullet points about your accomplishments and your value. Don't be afraid to tell your supervisor your value. Have specific examples of what you bring to the job. We still have a long way to go, so where do we go from here? The first step is always dialogue and education. We must talk about what changes are needed and why. We need to enlighten ourselves and others about what progress still needs to happen. We need to put together a plan to accomplish our goals. We need to stop labeling lawyers as male and female. We all passed the same bar exam and should have access to the same opportunities. My favorite quote from Justice Ginsburg speaks volumes. When I'm sometimes asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And I say, when there are nine, people are shocked, but there's been nine men and no one's ever raised a question about that. Very cool. Very cool. So Michelle said, you can get a Wi-Fi extender and people are saying video is freezing. I understand. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with the Wi-Fi. We have extenders. We have it literally plugged in directly to my computer and the Wi-Fi thing is like I could almost reach it. So I don't think an extender is going to help. I'm very frustrated by that. Hopefully by the next time we do a video, that'll be fixed. But I apologize. Um, I know it's annoying. I get it. I get it. I, I think it's annoying when I watch videos that free. So I don't blame you for that at all. Okay, so that's it for Sarah Boone if you want to take off, but I'm going to talk for a few minutes um, about my trial and why I'm here and what happened. It's a learning experience. It's kind of cool. Not kind of cool at all. It sucks, but it's probably cool and interesting for you guys um, to see how the, the justice system works, how the trial system works. So the case has been continued like six times. It's four years old. We're finally going and... Um, we get there and we start jury selection and I get up to ask my questions after the judge has asked a bunch of questions and somebody basically starts out by talking about all sorts of inadmissible stuff. They start talking about insurance and why it's a person there and not the car insurance company. And in Florida, you sue the individual, even if their insurance is paying, even if their insurance is paying for the lawyers, um, everybody has insurance basically when they go to trial for these types of cases, even though you say Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith and um, and so they wouldn't get off the insurance topic. And then, you know, we, we want to, as lawyers, we want to know what they like, what they don't like, what they, what they, what their biases may be. And a couple of people talked about how they hate Morgan and Morgan. And do I have any billboards and do I work for Morgan and Morgan? And they hate those kind of lawyers. And I'm like, no, I don't work for Morgan and Morgan, but we do the same type of work. And they're like, oh no, we're fine with you. As long as you're not with Morgan and Morgan and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, we do the same kind of work, right? I realize, you know, people have their feelings on them and we're not going to get into that right now. But if you hate PI lawyers and people that represent injured victims and you think they're all ambulance ch chasers, that's going to be pretty tough, right? And so we continue through. And one of the jobs when you're picking a jury and you're asking them questions is you want them to talk. You want them to tell you what their biases are. If my client starts out behind, we need to know that because maybe you won't be a fair and impartial juror. And basically everybody ends up saying that in one way or another. They're like, we think all these accidents are fake and fraudulent and we have a very real and good case here. So I was confident if we get to trial, we'll be able to show them like, no, that's not, that's not what this is. But if they say, no matter what, I'm going to think it's, you know, fraud or I'm going to think it's frivolous or this can't be a real thing. And you know, I just think all lawyers are slimy and trying to trick us. It becomes really difficult. So we dug in, we continued to try, we continued to see if there was going to be enough fair and impartial jurors there. But at the end of the day, the defense attorneys and us and the court all agreed the panel should be struck. 
because it just was such a brutal panel. And the most miserable part of that is the anxiety, the anxiously awaiting to start the trial that have been happening over the last couple of weeks with all the prep, prepping our experts, prepping our witnesses, prepping our poor client who was ready for this thing to go to trial. And now it's going to get continued again. Post COVID, our jurisdiction does one trial week per county. So that's it. And we didn't have enough jurors. And now it is what it is. And now it has to get continued. It's very brutal. It stinks. Once we started, I felt so good. The adrenaline was going. It was like we finally started the game. We were inside the, the lines and lights were on and it was time to go. It's like the leading up to it's the worst part. Once you actually go, it's so much fun. I love it. It's what we do. It's our practice. Prep is miserable. It's hard. I said in one of the videos yesterday, like this is why you guys wonder sometimes I don't crush lawyers um, when they try cases. If they make a mistake, I may disagree with what they do, but if they fumble over something, you know, even in the herd case when the guy objected to his own question, it's kind of funny and I get it, but it's hard. It's stressful. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of formality. There's a lot of importance to, you know, not buttering up the jury, but building trust with the jury so they don't think you're a slime ball. So they don't think you're a scumbag, right? A lot of you on here tell me all the time, Peter, we appreciate this. This, this makes us think better of lawyers. This helps us realize that not all lawyers are the stereotype. And I appreciate that so much. It hits me to the core. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. But I will tell you, a lot of people in the world are not like that. And so when they come to jury selection, a lot of times we have a lot of things that we have to deal with and work through with people. And it can be really hard. And it's important. And it's, a, it's the most important part of the trial to get a jury that's just going to come in there and not say, I love insurance companies or I hate insurance companies. Um, I think everybody that files a claim is right or I think everybody that files a claim is wrong. We don't want those people. We want people to come in and say, I don't care about anything else. Whatever you guys present is what I'm going to make the decision on. That's why I really preach that because I believe it. And that's what we really try to do in jury selection. Now, obviously, if I think somebody's going to be more sympathetic to my client and understand what my client's going through, maybe had a similar injury or been, been through something similar themselves, obviously that's good. And I would rather have that. Sometimes they get on, sometimes they don't. But we're not looking for biased people. AGSD. At jury duty, we were asked if we recognized the lawyers. All who did were dismissed. Wouldn't this be an issue for YouTube lawyers to be trial lawyers? So I will tell you, I've had people ask me that. And a couple people at the courthouse did come up to me and tell me they watched my videos, but they were like bailiffs or working security or the court reporter. That was our court reporter that the, that was hired by the defense. Actually, she did come up to me and she's like, so tell me, you really think Brian Koberger might be innocent? That's what she came up and asked me. I don't know if she's watching this now, but, um, and I was like, listen, he absolutely is presumed innocent, right? Until proven guilty. She's like, ah, oh, you have to say that. And it was funny. We had a little exchange about Brian Koberger, but out of everybody in the jury panel, everybody in the veneer, not a single person recognized me. Not a single person knew who I was. Not a single person watched the YouTube channel. So I have had no effect of that so far. And by the way, I was born and raised here. My dad was moved here 60 plus years ago. So we've been here over 60 years in Pinellas County. And this case was in Clearwater. So most other trials, I know at least one or two people sitting in there. This one, I didn't know anybody. So... It is what it is. And frankly, just because somebody watches my YouTube channel, they would not automatically be struck. If it was my mom or my best friend or somebody like that, sure. But if you're somebody who's never spoken to me before and you watch my YouTube channel and the judge says, could you be fair and unbiased? Would you automatically just vote with Peter Tragos, whatever he says? I hope you would say no to that. I hope you would look at the evidence and do what you think is right. Now, if you say, yes, I'll just do whatever Peter says and I love Peter so much, I don't think I could be fair and unbiased, then yeah, you'd get struck. But if you said, no, I think I could still listen to the evidence. I know Peter's a lawyer. I've disagreed with him on some cases, which my guess is almost every single person in this chat has disagreed with me on at least something. And you could even say that and be like, I've disagreed with him. And, you know, I think I'd be fair and impartial. Now the other side may strike you or they may want to keep you after hearing that. Who the heck knows? Brandy, how long do you have to wait now? We're picking a new trial date tomorrow. We're picking the date. It's going to be months. It's annoying. Very frustrating because we were very ready to go. 
Uh, Rebel, I wonder if the jurors will be told this is her seventh lawyer. That says a lot about her difficult personality. No, they will not know that. Uh, Jacqueline, I am off work because of, because of an illness that the doctors can't figure out how to fix me. Need prayers. Jacqueline, absolutely. That's that's the worst. That's literally the worst. I will be praying. Sarah said, I was on a grand jury once. There were zero juror questions. I found it odd. Well, so I don't know what you mean, like the lawyers ask, because there are some situations where the judges don't let the lawyers ask questions in certain jurisdictions. So I don't know what you meant specifically by that. Um, but if you meant like throughout the trial, the jury didn't ask questions. Rexy, my husband always disagrees with you, Peter. Exactly. So if, if you were there, you'd be like, listen, sometimes I disagree with Peter, but I got my husband who I married, love of my life, always disagrees with Peter. So who the heck knows? Or if he was there, he'd be like, I don't know that guy. I don't like that guy. I always disagree with him. I just hear him in the background or hear my wife say, Peter said this. Thank you, Jacqueline, for the super sticker. Okay. So that's it. My brain is kind of fried. Um, not a ton going on that I've looked at content wise. So I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I appreciate everybody who was thinking about me and, and you know, sent me some messages. Um, about the trial, wishing me good luck. I, I always appreciate that because um, it, it feels cool to know a lot of people are behind you thinking about you and it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. Um, I do love doing it. Um, I love being a lawyer. Um, I've said a million times, I love doing this stuff on YouTube, but I'm not going to stop being a lawyer. I take less cases, but um, I, I still love it. And we have a lot of lawyers and we work on it as a team and it's it's fun. But um, oh, so she meant to pick the jurors. Yeah. So some jurisdictions, like I, I had tried a case in federal court and they didn't let, let us ask any questions either. We submitted questions to the judge. Um, but, um, the judge is the one that asked them. What if you watch a lot of trials? Yes or no in the jury? I, I don't think it would be a negative. I think I'd ask you about it. What you think about them, what you know about them. Could you leave what you think the rules should be out from the trials you've watched, especially if you've watched in other jurisdictions and listen to and watch our trial and just go by the rules the judge tells you is the law in our trial. That's probably what um, what I would ask you about that. I think it'd be cool if somebody was, has watched a lot of trials and was on one of my juries. Uh, Zappa said, wasn't expecting to see you again for a long time. Um, so yeah, so we will be doing more videos this week um, and I'll see what's coming up. I'll catch up on some stuff because I have no idea what's been going on in the world. Gringa, outside of law and nerdery, most people are unaware of most of these cases we all know so well. Absolutely. It's a niche. It's definitely a growing niche, but it's still a niche nonetheless. All right. So I'm going to redirect you now. Make sure that autoplay is turned on. There's like a button you can click <clears throat> next to the gears on your um, video, and it'll immediately switch you over to our Courtney Clenny parents interview. They make some statements that I find very interesting that I can, can tell us some of what is going to be put up in her case by the defense. So hopefully you guys can check that out. Make sure you hit the like button here. And when you get there, I'm going to finish here with Nikki's question. Is it true that attorneys do not want jurors who have worked for the police department? I was an administrative assistant. Absolutely not true in civil cases. Um, in criminal cases, if you represent a criminal defendant, you probably don't want somebody that's worked in the police department. It's going to be hard for them to, um, for some people in there to, to not bring that into the case, what they've seen and what they've learned. I appreciate you guys so much. I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.